Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a small joint, which makes us a lot of trouble still in 2023. So I try to give you our ideas and what we've learned within the last 15 years where we did some of studies. So this is the Isaacos Upper Extremity Committee at the time of the um, Shanghai meeting. And a lot of what I'm telling you is, of course, based on, on the work of the groups, our Yukon group, Andreas Imhoff has done a lot of work with that. So we came up with the consensus statement and tried to diversify the classic Rockwood classification. And it's now 10 years, so it's a little bit time to revisit it and think what we have learned. So the first question is, should we do surgery on AC joint instability at all. And when you look at the literature, and we did some of the reviews, um, and this one in 2019 was the most downloaded paper in arthroscopy journal. So we see that there is similar outcomes for conservative and surgical management. And we see that if you have surgery, perhaps you have less pain, but uh, of course, when doing surgery, you can have complications. And there's still a so recurrence rate in, in the surgical groups of about 14 to 20%. And when you look at long time data with comparative studies, one from Scandinavia and one from Canada, using hook plate, using Femister technique, but they still didn't show any difference. I mean, if you read into it, you see that the Femister technique had 30% of failures with the nails, but still it's hard to compete with this evidence. However, I do see patients in my clinic who have issues with a chronic instability of the AC joint. And this guy, he is a 20 year old guy. He had his injury six months ago, had a type four lesion, and um, he had problems when playing tennis. And he had a clicking and pain overhead. So he had no other problems. So you see the patient reported outcome scores I show you there, uh, which I take. So I did surgery at this guy with an ASES score of 92, which is nearly perfect. So the problem he had is not picked up by the AACS score. So of course we have problems in getting this and the result into our evidence. Tossi tried to do a pretty easy classification of AC joints 60 years ago. Um, and he was like no gross evidence of tears, slight, moderate, and then severe. And then came up Rockwood with his classification, which I think basically is up today, the gold standard where everybody reports to. We have type 1, type 2 where the AC joint, the capsule is attached, then type 3 with the addressing of the CC ligaments and type 5 when also the fascia is um, damaged and the horizontal instabilities like a type 4 which is impinged into the trapezius. But we still have to think about if this is really the gold standard where we can base our treatment on. So first thing, how to find the correct diagnosis and what imaging to do. So we did a literature research and came with, up with this uh, publication that the bilateral sanka, that seems to be the, the best imaging. And a uh, provocative view, like the Alexander view, helps you to see the horizontal instability. Because that's the real life. This is basically AP views of a patient with an AC joint instability you get when you are in your clinic from the, air, uh, from the emergency room. And if you look at these patients, the question is always, which is the higher instability? And you take this patient into the bilateral zanka, you see that there is a CC distance of more than 100%. So this is a type 5 instability. The other one who looked more on the AP view in the zanka image has not so much distance at his CC ligaments. So he has this problem in the horizontal area. So this is a type 3 or type 4 type with a horizontal instability. And also the question of weight-bearing, non-weight-bearing. We traditionally or we usually don't do weight-bearing images because this is a police guy, 36 years old. He was a special team parachute jumper. And this upper image was eight days after trauma. We thought this is a type three, so we kept him conservatively. And then seven weeks after the trauma, we did the same imaging without load and you see that you have the, now the much higher instability grade. So what happens when the AC joint has an instability? You see in this image, so the acromion is going underneath the lateral clavicle. That's where the acromion want to go. And this is because the AC joint and the clavicle works like a strut. If you have a racing car and you want to drive 
fast, you need this strut because when you go into the curve, your car has ringing forces and if you have a strut in there, this helps you to be more stable in the racing. So this is basically what the intact SC joint does. And when you look at the anatomy, you see that this joint has a lot of motion, which is allows, and it's not a strict joint. So we need to reproduce this motion for the complex motion of the scapular thoracic motion. And if you look at horses, when they move, they have the scapula on the side of their core. They don't have a clavicle because they only have this pendulum motions. And when you look at the humans, we need the clavicle for our force 360 degree motion. Type 1, type 2 instabilities, basically this is consensus that this is the field of conservative treatment. Literature is not absolutely clear on this, but really good data out there that these should be treated conservatively. When you talk about the type 3 instabilities, what we know from the Italian groups is that the patients who have problems with their scapula, the scapular dyskinesis, these are the patients who have pain and who have problems. And if you train them for their scapula and if you get them to, to be a coper, to be muscular coping with this instability, then they are happy and then they don't have problems anymore. And the nice thing is that there is about a cutoff time point of about six weeks. So we can put them into training for about six weeks. And then we will see if they profit from it, if they get to become copers or not. And then you can decide what to do with them. And I told you in the other talk that there is a very good scapular rehabilitation program out there with all these specific things you can build up and do a really good training. So talking to you about the imaging, talking to you about this coping and about the time frame, this brought us up with the ISACOS to the point that we said perhaps you need something more to the classification than just the imaging according to Rockwood. So this is why we came up with the type 3A and type 3B, the 3B. Basically, 3A are the ones who can later cope um, with their scapula, and the 3Bs are the ones who have the competing horizontal instability and who cannot cope with this instability. There's also already data out there which check the reliability of our uh, modification classification, and this was shown to be good. And this is a very interesting new study coming from Denmark. Klaus Buck and his groups uh, I just finished this and I'm uh, in the committee of the PhD thesis, so that's why I'm happy to be able to present you some of this data which will come up on the market. They looked at 100 AC joint instabilities, acute traumatic type 5, type 3, and out of these 100, only 9 opted for surgery. And it's interesting to look into their data and what they found is that patients who have restrictive motion after five weeks, patients who have infavorable scores after five weeks, overhead athletes, these are more the patients who end up with surgery. So again, we seem to have this cut up with a little bit time frame where we can make a better decision than just looking at the x-ray. This is again our algorithm which we published where you can find that. So today for me, with this part of the decision making, the last key point for me is look at my patient. We know that some of these patients have a higher risk to become problems later on, and some of these patients don't have. Like an overhead athlete, as I told you, a manual worker who is working heavy loads, they have rather problems with an instability of the AC joint. I just have an orthopedic colleague who is doing foot and ankle surgery, and when he's like doing all these foot and ankle motions, uh, he has this impinging with his uh, instability. And on the other hand, a contact athlete like an ice hockey player who is banging against the wall within the next two weeks, they don't need their AC joint so much. They can be pretty happy and good athletic without the function of the AC joint. So here's a type 3 conservative treatment. You can get up very successful with this. So for me, the type 3s, I absolutely start with conservative treatment. And this is an interesting case. This was a race driver, semi-professional. So he won the championship, and it was the second last race they won. So then they went out for drinking, and he fell off his e-bike, and he had his type 5 lesion. So the problem was he had to finish the final race of the championship, which was in four weeks. So what to do? He has a five, type 5 instability, and we are losing the window of acute treatment. But he's a race driver, he only has to 
to work with the steering wheel. And this is him after four weeks with a type 5 injury. He was happy to do his race, win his championship, and since then he's happy with his AC, AC joint. Do we lose something if we start conservatively and don't opt for surgery? In Germany, there's always this thought that you have to treat an AC joint acutely, very early, because all the chronic treatments are failures and are not good. So there is not a problem. We have shown data from our group that um, if you treat them after a conservative treatment, you have a good chance to have very good results. So telling you all this story that only a few patients really need surgery, it is important that when we talk about surgery, we try to be secure and use a secure system to not make it worse than it's been before. So that's the point for me to have a technique which is simple and easy to apply and anatomic. And I can use the same technique with the bracings in the acute setting and I add just a tendon to the same thing for the chronic setting. So that I don't do a Weber done something very special and a femister in the acute. I really try to have the same anatomic approach. We have shown data biomechanically that this is very sufficient working with these braces, braces and especially with Andrea's group. We have shown long time data, more than I think 10 year data is coming out right now, that you have a very high return to sport with these techniques and you can be very successful. We also looked at the different ways how we can address the capsule. Do we need CC and AC reconstructions? I can tell you the more chronic you get, the more important it is to stay anatomic. And if you address the capsule, stay at the original areas of the capsule, don't get a windshield wiper effect. And with these anatomic techniques, we really have better results all over the literature than with the non-anatomic techniques. Another point for this treatment is that the bigger the tunnel sizes are, the higher the risk for fracture. So that's what we came up to really try to have small bone tunnels. And um, besides the small bone tunnels, which is a reason for me to only have one system at the core proclavicular um, stability, it's also load sharing. By addressing the capsule as well, I can take away load from the CC construct. We know that a slight over reduction is very helpful. Um, so there's a slack of about two millimeters in these systems after three months. So it's important or it's good when you have a slight over reduction. And then all the reviewers came up and said, don't you, are you not afraid that you have too much pressure in the joint? No, you don't get too much pressure in the joint. We've done pressure control in the joints. If you reproduce them in the anatomic state, there's no increase in pressure. An osteoarthritis of the AC joint in an instability case after surgical treatment is basically never a topic to treat. They really never get into osteoarthritis. Totally different than you have it in the knee joint. So this is our aiming devices. We do it arthroscopically assisted to have a very good view on the coracoid base. We have 2.4 cannulated drills, so very small drill holes. And we can use the same drill also for doing our um, cyclage at the AC joint, addressing that. With the implants, I showed you the dog bones. We have the problems that the knots are on, to on top. They can be irritating. So this is the fourth generation of implants, which are knotless implants, like the ones perhaps you know from the ACL. So we don't have this issue anymore with the knots on top. And you can tension this very nicely down. Uh, and especially in, in chronic situation, uh, you can come out with like a four millimeter or 4.5 millimeter tunnel where you have this bracing implant and a gracilis tendon inside the tunnel, uh, which really is very nice in a small um, drill hole. So this is an acute case, um, 54 year old male patient. He had a hook plate a couple of years on the other side, so he wanted surgery. Uh, we did the bracing, we're very happy with this. And this is an interesting case, a 15 year old girl, she went with a roller coaster, had no real trauma, had horizontal instability. I took her six months in conservative treatment and we still had the problems. And then when I opted for surgery, and this was very impressive, you see this massive horizontal instability in this case. So we treated her combined with the new implant and with a gracilis graft, and this is her about three to four months. So this is how the girls in Germany look like when they're 15 years old. But this is her motion and she's happy. She's back into cheerleading now one year out of surgery um, and, and happy. Thank you very much.